Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, let's just give God praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, well, here we are. It is a new year. It's a new day. It's a new season. It's a new theme. We are going in with all this year, and I just want to take some time and unpack that uh, for you today. We're going to be talking just kind of the overarching vision and the direction and where we're going to be headed uh, into this year. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 12, and snuggled in the middle of this chapter is our key verse for the whole year, and here's what it says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Come on, let's say that again, but this time let's say it like we mean it. Are you ready? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Sounds like somebody decided to come to church today. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that is an awesome verse, and it has huge implications. And it's one thing to get up here, and it's one thing to say it, and we can even rally around and say it as a church. But how do we do that, and what does it mean to love God with all? And so I want to give you a little bit of context about where this verse came from and, and what's being what's going on right here. You see, Jesus says this verse. Jesus is the one who is uh, making this proclamation. And he's making it because his authority was being challenged. I don't know if any managers or supervisors or business owners or moms and dads in the house, but your authority has ever been challenged. Nobody likes that, right? How many have turned to your, to your kids and you said, just because I said so, that's why. Don't challenge my authority. I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. <clears throat> Jesus' authority, thank God that Jesus doesn't treat us that way, man. He is a God of love and grace and mercy. And, and so Jesus makes this statement in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, after his, after his uh, authority is being challenged. It's being challenged by three cast of characters. There's Pharisees and Sadducees and a lawyer. And it kind of sounds like a bad joke, doesn't it? A Pharisee, a Sadducee, and a lawyer walk into a bar. Anyway. <laughs> so the Pharisees, uh, you got to understand, Jerusalem in that day was under Roman occupation. Rome had moved in. They were, there was a lot of uh, tension between the Jews and the Romans. And they, the Pharisees were the religious ruling class. They were the ones that were trying to keep peace between the Jews and Rome. And so they were really caught in this tension. And Jesus shows up. And Jesus, his mere presence just began to create some uh, some uh, some problems, and so uh, because of his his teachings and the and the things that he was saying and the following that he was gaining, and so the Pharisees decided we need to take Jesus out of the picture because he's going to cause problems with us with Rome. So they needed to trap him. They couldn't just get rid of him. He had a huge following, and so they decided to trap him. They were they were trying to get him to say something uh, that would incriminate himself. And so they, they posed a question and they said, hey, Jesus, what about taxation? Should we give, pay taxes to, uh, to, to Rome? And, uh, and, and the reason that this was a, a problem was because um, Rome uh, was ruled by Caesar and Caesar claimed to be God. And so therefore they would be paying taxes to a God that was not their one God, which was a violation of the Ten Commandments. And so this was, they were, trying, they were trying to lure him into this trap. And so Jesus, you know, asked, said, give me a coin whose face is on the coin, all that Caesar's. And he says this, pay your taxes. That's what he said, essentially. He said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. And, and so church, let me, just in light of the fact that tax season is on her way, pay your taxes. But that's not what I'm preaching about today. So the Pharisees, they tried, they tried to, uh, to trap him and they failed. Now, the Sadducees are also a religious ruling class in Jerusalem of that day. And they say, hey, the Pharisees failed. We're going to give it a try. 
And so they, now one of the big differences between Pharisees and Sadducees was um, because they, they were both, um, they were kind of like our political classes of today. We've got Republicans and Democrats. Um, they were, they were uh, the same kind of thing, but they were religious classes. And, and they had a lot of power and a lot of authority in Jerusalem. Uh, but in, so, so they, they, they were all believers in God. They just saw things from different points of view. And, 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 and one of the main delineations was in terms of um, their feelings on the resurrection of, from the dead, people being raised from the dead. Sadducees do not believe in that. No way. And it's interesting because they try to trap Jesus with a question, actually a riddle about being raised from the dead. What's going to happen? And so it's a very long and, and involved uh, riddle that they pose to him, but Jesus answers it masterfully. And, and so once again, they tried and they failed. And so then, you, then we're introduced in the book of Mark chapter 12 to this lawyer. And the lawyer, I don't believe, was actually trying to entrap Jesus. I think that he was observing that Jesus was a pretty smart guy and that and that, and that, uh, and that, uh, and that he he was gonna that that, and so he he posed a question to Jesus. It was both a legal question, but really more a religious question, because even though the lawyer was a, a, a man of the law, he also was a Jew, and therefore he was religious. And how many know when you ask a religious question, you're expecting a religious response, right? And that's exactly what happens. So this lawyer comes and he says, hey, listen, Jesus, I got a question for you. Uh, of all the commands in the Bible, which is the most important? What is the, what is the greatest command in, from God? And, uh, and so Jesus answers him and he answers him right away. He doesn't have to think about it. He's not like, no, you know, there's like 600 of them, which, man, which, I mean, immediately Jesus responds with what is known as Shema. And Shema, it means hear or listen. And it is a, uh, it is a, um, uh, a prayer or a command, a teaching that any respectable Jew of that day and into today memorize and they recite daily. This is something that's in front of them all the time. And so this is what, so Jesus' response, when we read this passage in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, what Jesus is actually referencing is Shema. And it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 in the Old Testament. That's what I want to read to you right now. It reads this way. It says, hear or listen, Shema. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. So right here, the Bible says it's okay to annoy your kids. You tell them over and over and over and over again. Talk about them when you were at home and when you were on the road and when you go to bed and when you get up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I think that God was trying to get a message across that this, this idea of loving him with all was preeminent. It was absolutely uh, the most important thing that you could do. And it says in here that he, that you're to tie them uh, around, uh, to, to wear them on your forehead. Uh, so if you follow uh, or, or, or are familiar with Orthodox Judaism, you know that a lot of times you'll see them wearing these little uh, boxes on their foreheads and on their biceps. Um, there's leather straps they put around their arms. I think I got a picture of uh, of one here. These are uh, phylacteries, they, they call them, or uh, teflon. And, and so inside of that box is Shema. It's one of the, is one of the, the scriptures, Shema. There's several uh, that are in there, but Shema is one of them. And so the idea is anything you think, anything that goes through your brain needs to go to the, through the filter of the fact that I love God with all. So whatever I think is going to run right through that filter. Uh, and, and the reason they put them on their arm up to their bicep, because there's an artery that connects right to your heart. And so, and so the idea is everything in my heart and everything in my mind is all run through this grid of the fact 
that I love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. It's an awesome, awesome display of the, of the absolute commitment to, to God. Consequently, how many know that the devil is the great deceiver? He is, the, he is, uh, he is uh, crafty. Uh, he is um, perverted. Do you know the devil perverts everything that is good? Everything that is good, everything that is of God, the devil has a counterfeit for. That's, that the Bible calls him, he says this of the devil. He is the great deceiver and the truth is not in him. And, and, and even in this, we see in scripture that he even, uh, he even has a perversion of this. Because if you jump to the book of Revelation, you will see that when the beast comes to power and, he, and, the, and there's a mandate that all men and women must uh, wear the mark of the beast, 666, the, the, the number of man, they must wear that in order to buy or to sell in the, in those, during the tribulation. Then where does it say that that mark is going to be placed? On your arm or on your, or on your hand or on your forehead. And so again, so, so here we're seeing that the, the enemy doesn't want God to have anything. He wants to rob God of all things. And he wants to rob you of your thinking. He wants to rob you of your heart. This is why we have a whole culture that is saying that things that are evil are good and things that are good are evil. Because the enemy has perverted, uh, perverted that which is true. So Jesus answers this lawyer with Shema. He answers him with, hear, O Israel, the Lord alone. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and, and then the lawyer responds in Mark chapter 12 and verse 32. He says this. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Can I tell you something? When you love somebody... You listen to them and you follow through, amen? And when God gives us a command, showing him that we love him is an act of obedience. When we obey him, the Bible says this, it says that obedience is better than sacrifice. So I can, you can do, oh, look at all I gave up for God, true, but did you obey him? And that's exactly what the lawyer is saying here. He says, he says this act of obedience is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And watch, I like verse 34, it says, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you kind of got it, kid. You're almost there. You're, you're, gonna, you're, you're almost there, man. And, 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 he, and, and he says, you, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Well, I guess not. So let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this day. It's the day you've made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Father, it, this is a new season for this church. And I pray, God, that as we get into your word, help it to open up our hearts to understand deeper what you want and where you want us to go. Father, I pray, God, that this would inspire, bless, touch. And, Father, that people would leave here today better than they did when they came in. In the mighty name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Name it. This fall, my wife was um, at a conference, and uh, in, in, here in, in well in Massachusetts, and she ran into a, another pastor's wife that she, somebody she knows for a long time, and they were talking about the idea of themes in church. You know, and, and the question was, does your church do yearly themes? Of course, which we do, or we have since 2014. And so my wife answered. She said, "You know." She said, this is the time of year that my husband uh, really begins to really focus on uh, hearing what the theme will be for the following year, which is true. I've really, uh, during the fall, during uh, late September, October is when I, in my prayer time is when I really began asking God to, to just order our steps. And this other pastor's wife responded kind of funny. She said, she said, well, what's there to pray about? She said, it's 2020. It's the year of vision. I mean, that's, that's, that's the theme. It's fresh vision. And what was funny was I had, before my wife had gone on that trip, I told her, I said, one thing I can tell you, Jeanette, uh, our theme is not going to be fresh vision in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it's such a knee-jerk reaction. I was like, it, I mean, listen, I mean, no disrespect, honestly, if there's a church that's running with that theme. But for me, I thought, you know what? The whole reason I go to prayer is because I want fresh vision. The whole reason I go and I seek God is because I want crystal clear clarity, whether it's 2020 or 1999, baby. I want to know exactly what God wants for our church for this season. It has nothing to do with a number. It has, it has to do with what God wants to do. And, and here's the funny thing. People think, well, 2020, that's perfect vision. No, it's not. It's average vision. I don't want, I don't want average vision. I don't want an average idea. I don't want to understand on, on just a, I want to know exactly. See, look, here's, here's what 2020 vision means. 2020 vision means that when you stand in front of the Snellen scale, that, that, that chart that has the letters, those of you who have not memorized it, right, for your driving test, <laughs> It's so funny because you can, right? You can go online and just download it. But anyway, not that we would ever do that. <laughs> what? And um, so, so you got the scale, and from 20 feet away, you can read clearly out of both eyes up to a certain point, usually that green line. There's, there's a line or there's a, a specific row that, is, that, that you should, for the average person with uh, clear vision with no glasses or contact should be able to read that from 20 feet away. That's, that's good vision. But it's not perfect vision. There's better vision than that. Now listen, I, 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 um, I don't hear very well. I, uh, I have uh, tinnitus and nerve damage in my ears. Um, probably comes from using a lot of heavy equipment and, um, and a lot of machinery uh, in, in some of the jobs I've carried over the years, as well as uh, extremely loud music in my teen years. Ugh. And um, I thought it was a good idea to take the back seat out of my car and put 18 inch woofers and all that, you know, <laughs> stupid. But anyway, you, know, you spend thousands of dollars to, to, to have music that you get pulled over because it's so loud and nobody can ride in your car because you've got no seats, you know. But you're cool, man, you're gonna impress the girls. Because every girl wants that, right? But anyway, <clears throat> so, so I have ringing in my ears. I have tinnitus all the time. And, and on top of that, I have middle tone hearing loss. So a lot of times when we're in a, in a room and there's a lot of people, especially out in the lobby, and, you're, and we, you and I are talking, and I'll be, I'll be leaning in and I'll be turning my head. I'm not disinterested. I'm literally trying to hear what you're saying. So I have poor hearing, but for where I have lost hearing, I've made up for it in my eyesight. I have never in my whole life have I ever had 20-20 vision. I've always had better than 20-20 vision. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and even today, I'm pushing 50 years old, and I have 2015 vision. And so all that means is what, where the average person stands 15 feet from that, from that scale, and they can read clearly, I can stand 20 feet away and read what takes them, you know, five feet closer. Big deal, right? So anyway, um, but that's, that's my point. And that's not even the best vision. It gets even better. There's 2010 vision. And, they, and so uh, most, most people in the, uh, in the optics world uh, kind of settle on the standard of 27 vision as being the most acute vision. Or not, nobody would say you have perfect vision because you could see something, you know, crystal clear this way, but blind as a bat in your periphery. So, uh, but, but the point is this, you could have 2007 vision and that's kind of considered the best vision. So if you want to run off of a theme about vision, you should have done that 13 years ago in 2007. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I want to, I want to understand with crystal clear clarity with absolute certainty. I want to hear the word of the Lord and the direction of God every year. And in fact, I want to hear it every month and week and day and hour and minute. I want to hear and know and understand the spirit of God speaking to me personally so clearly that every time I'm supposed to move, he says, this is the way, walk ye in it. And my answer, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do and stop when you want me to stop and pray when you want me to pray and give when you want me to give and serve where you want me to serve. I will do what you want me to do, but I can hear that and understand it because I am so driven to 
hear the word of the Lord and to see what he wants for my future. And that, I think, should be, our, should be the litmus test for us as we move into a new year. Amen? And so we're going to be looking at this idea of with all, all year long. So I hope you like the theme. Or else you're going to be awfully bored the next 52 weeks. But with all means this. See, when we commit ourselves with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, when you really do that, then you're saying, God, I give you permission. That's what Shalem preached on last week in Psalm 139. Search me, O Lord. See if there's any impure way in me. Test me. And there's five prayers in that passage of Scripture. Dangerous prayers. Prayers that will change your life if you allow them to. And, and so it's kind of like, like your heart is, a, is an onion and God just begins to peel back the layers of that onion, layer by layer, just showing you and revealing to you the things in your life that need to change, things in your life that are going to be different. But let me say this. We all want revelation, right? Revelation, understanding. But if you have revelation with no activation, then there's no acceleration. Come on, somebody. If you have if you have revelation with it will demand activation and if there's no activation there'll be no acceleration. You can have all the knowledge you want about this Bible but if you don't apply any of it to your heart it's never going to change you. you. You listen the devil knows this word as he tempted Jesus with the Bible. He knows this word but but it clearly he's not applying it to his life. So when you follow God with all, it's going to challenge you in all the areas of your life. Amen? And so there are going to be things that you say and places you go and things that you do, practices that you stand for, and the Holy Spirit is going to begin to challenge you and reveal to you that, uh uh-oh, you might be wrong. I know. It's hard to believe. No way could I possibly be wrong. But, but, but the Holy Spirit will begin to challenge you. And, and church, uh, when, when this happens, this, this changing in our life or this revelation that leads to change in the, in the Christian world is called sanctification. It's the sanctification process. See, some believe that you're saved and sanctified. I don't believe that. I believe it's a, it's a process of, of God revealing to you and making changes. And, and how many of you, how many of you uh, say and do and believe things differently now than you did five years ago, right? Amen? How, how, how many of you have changed some of your habits and some of the places that you, uh, some of your entertainment or some of the people even maybe that you've hung around because God's revealed things to you? So, so the, the point is, is a, it's a, you know, <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, we used to sing that little song. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Here we go. Took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. (laughs) Am I the only person that's heard this song? (laughs) All right. Come on, Grace. Sing it with me. How loving and patient he must be. Come on. Amen. He's still working on me. He's still working on me. Sanctification. And listen, when you, when you, so when you are presented with revelation, you have a choice. You have a choice. And that's what's so good about our God, so great about our God. He is not, he's not the all-powerful, mighty God, the lightning bolts waiting to strike you down and condemn you to hell because of all your terrible, putrid, wretched sin. That's not how my God is. My God sits mighty on his throne with grace and love and authority and power. And he looks for hearts that are willing to be open to him. And when they are open, he will say, okay, here's, if you truly, if you're truly living your life through the grid of loving me with all, then these are areas that, these are growth areas for you. This is something that my word can help you with. This is something that you need to discipline yourself in. And and if you're obedient, so, so you have a choice. And the choice is you can choose to walk through that and you can accept that revelation. And when you do, your spiritual life takes off like a rocket. Truth. I'm telling you. But you also have the choice to have fresh vision, but turn a blind eye to it. 
And when you have fresh vision and you turn a blind eye to it, it comes with a consequence. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10 that when we do that, that he hides his face from us. That when we turn our blind eye to the leading of his spirit, then he will turn his eyes from those that are doing evil. He turns his eyes from those that are doing harm or being unclean or oppressing those who, uh, who are innocent uh, in, amongst other things, Isaiah teaches us. The book of Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 3 says that the fear of the Lord or the love of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, if you truly love the Lord, you're going to hate evil. Church, what fellowship does light have with darkness? None. We, there is no place, there's no middle ground. Our God is purely holy. There is no room for sin in heaven. Zero. This is why good works do not get you to heaven. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. Only the forgiveness of our sin that's been covered by the sacrifice of Christ covers us and allows us to be admitted into heaven because the Bible says none of us are righteous. Nobody, nobody can do that on our, on our own. And so, and so, we, and so we, must, we must be purified by, by the Lord. So here's, here's the, the proposal for 2020. It's clear messaging. And, 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 and it's this idea that we're going to love him with all. And I'm going to be honest with you. There are going to be times in this year, and, and, and look, I'm just the messenger. Everybody say, we love the messenger. Okay? Thank you. I'm not up here on a soapbox. I'm not up here saying, I got it all figured out. I'm not up here saying that you're, you're a wretched sinner and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm telling you, I'm just being obedient to what the Holy Spirit has told me and is showing me and instructing me through his word. And, and this is one of the things that, that the Lord revealed to me was that there are going to be times where I'm going to have to approach some of these scriptures this year and it's not going to win me any friends. It's a good thing. <laughs> that I didn't come here to be popular. <laughs> but, but, but church, you gotta understand, the reason, the reason that you discipline your children is not because you want, because you're sadistic and you wanna torture them, <laughs> right? The reason you discipline your children is why? Because you love them, because you're, because you're trying to grow them, because you want them to be uh, upstanding citizens. You want them to be self-reliant. You want them to be able to succeed in life. And so there's, so there's disciplines that you instill and that you teach and that you enforce inside of your family so that they become better. Same is true with our Lord. These are spiritual uh, absolutes that, that if, if, if trifled with can cause eternal damage in our life. And so God is saying this year, there may be some situations, there may be some sermons, there may be some things that are brought up that you're going to be in such disagreement with that for some, they, they might even leave the church over it. The Bible prophesies about that. Not everybody wants to hear the truth is what I'm saying. And so, so church, let me, let me just, I'm trying to get this out from the very beginning. Okay. I want you to understand that, that I, I'm just trying to be obedient to the Lord. Okay. And so, and so if, if the Lord just like, if you feel sucker punched in church one Sunday, it's not me. Okay. <laughs> it's not me. Take it out with the big guy. Okay. I want our church to have that 27 clarity every year. That's what we strive for. Ever since we've done themes, uh, that's what we strove for. Uh, 2014, I've, I've been here since 2012. 2014 was the first year we did a, a year-end theme. And that theme uh, was, was based out of Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And, and we had to learn that we serve a God in which, for which nothing is made impossible. And he, he makes the impossible possible. And that, man, that was just, when you really believe that, it changes everything. It changes everything. When you see how big your God really is, in 2015, he wanted us to have that clarity of John 4, 35, which says that the fields were ripe for the harvest and it was the year of his overflow. 
Church, I will tell you that year, we doubled in size as a church. Not, not because we had great evangelistic programs, but because God was sending some of you. He was sending reinforcements from all around this area and people were pouring into this church so fast. It was the year of God's overflow. In 2016, he wanted us to have that clarity, clarity and vision when we uh, discussed Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, that even though we were going deep, he wanted us to go deeper still. He wanted us to go down to the bottom of the pool where it hurts your ears. Remember that? And in 2017, he wanted us to have that kind of clarity, and he, he declared over us Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19, which said, Behold, I am doing a new thing. And a new thing he did. And he continues to do. And in 2018, we have the clarity of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, which said that we needed to redeem the time that we had. Make the most of every opportunity. I kissed my daughter goodbye after first service, and she's off to college again. Let me tell you something. I have learned to count the days and the minutes. It is heart-wrenching. I don't know about you. I know a lot of you are further down that journey than I am, but I'm telling you right now, if you've got a junior in high school or a senior in high school, life is about to be hell for you. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church? <clears throat> hate it. I hate it. But last year, I'm teasing, by the way, if you're a guest here, life is not hell, okay? Life is good. Life is good. It's fully alive that we've lived it all year. Last year, 2019, he made it crystal clear. John 10, 10. Here's the enemy's motive to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his, that's his vision. But Christ has come that you would have Zoe life, fully alive, uh, abundant life. And we live that out all year long. Cornerstone, God has been molding us and he's been shaping us. And he's over these past several years as a body and he's proven himself to, to us, not that he needed to, but he has because he's a loving and faithful God over and over again. And, and, and so his directives have been clear. And for those of you who have taken that divine instruction literally and passionately, you have seen tremendous growth in your life, in your family's life, and in this church's life. So you know what? He deserves a little bit of praise. Let's just say thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Shared about my daughter going off back to school. She, Shaylin spoke here yesterday, if you weren't, yesterday, last week. And, uh, and she, she shared beautifully, masterfully, just, uh, just uh, shared the scriptures, preached out of Psalm 139, and, 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 uh, and the subject matter was embracing the change, embracing the change. And uh, after the service, uh, I had no less than 10 people that came up to me, and they shook my hand, and they said, Pastor, you're fired. And I thought, and I say, I say, so this is my response. I'm like, listen, you can fire me if you want, but if I go, she's coming with me. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that she talked about was that she opened up her sermon with reflection, with looking in the rearview mirrors, with looking back at where we've, where we've come from. And the reason that you should look back sometimes is because time is a great teacher. Amen. Time is a great teacher. I've, I've been, I'll be finishing up eight years here at the church, and I've learned some things in these eight years. And so, and what I've learned is that when you understand how far you've come from and, 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 and where you are today, um, it gives you perspective on where you're, where you're heading for the future. In other words, what, what got you from where you were to where you are is going to be the same formula that will get you from where you are to where you're going to be. But there's a difference. There's a difference in, in, the, in the two. And the difference is this, is that this, this time, uh, this time you have uh, more faith moving forward. This time you have double the wisdom because you've, you've already learned some things from the, this time you have double the drive. 
Because you've seen God be faithful, 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 and you know he's never, uh, he, that he never changes. You, you've got double the understanding you, than, than you ever had before. You've got more acceleration that you're going to get to, you're going to get to that destination faster than you did to the one that you're sitting in right now. You're going to have double the results. Listen, this should excite some of you because I will tell you, some of you started your Christian journey and it's been bumpy and it's been hard and you've struggled and you've had some hardships. But I will tell you that as you reflect, maybe you've been saved for, for five weeks. Maybe, maybe you've given your life to Christ a year ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago. But whatever the case, where you are today, when you reflect on how faithful God has been in the past, it, it just arms you to be able to forge ahead for the future because God's got greater, bigger, higher, deeper, more in store for you. And you will accomplish all of it because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because you're going to remember, you're going to remember what it was like three years ago when you slew those giants in your life. And now that there's bigger giants that are facing you today, you're going to say, well, God was faithful then. He's going to be faithful now. Amen. You're going to remember what it was like when you had to walk on the water and he met you on the water then. This time, those white waves might be way bigger and they might be crashing even more vigorously. But you know what? You are going to still step out of that boat because your faith has doubled. You follow me. You're going to see mountains cast into the sea. We've got so much more, church. And, and so this is exactly what the enemy wants to rob you from. He wants to get us, he wants to get your eyes and get our focus on all the problems. Listen, what, what are we at January? What is today? 12th? 12th. 12 days in this new year. How many of you have just been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting with the devil ever since day one, right? I'm telling you, this morning it happened to me. I was like, what in the world? And it has been difficult, whether it's colds and, uh, and, you, and, and, and sickness and, and whatever. I mean, there's just been so much that gets thrown at you. Why? Because the devil doesn't want you to walk in the fullness of your, of your purpose. And reflection brings your 2020 vision down to that 27 vision. Reflection helps you to, to uh, focus acutely and it makes you see clearly what most people are unable to make out spiritually, you see with clarity. And so to illustrate this, the Lord drew me to something. I was praying in my office and he brought me to Galatians chapter six, verse seven and eight. It's the, it's the law of see Mike coming. I, I see him coming. Somebody stop him. I mean... <laughs> jump out in the aisle tackling come on up man you can stay up here and play as long as I let you <laughs> man don't you guys love this guy he is he is bro you're the man he is the man I'll tell you serves this church faithfully Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says this do not be de deceived God will not be mocked for whatever a man soweth that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. It's the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Whatever you put into it, you're going to get out of it. We've all heard the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Do you know that the world thinks you're insane? come to church do you know you are insane come to church. we are we are because I come I come here I do the same thing I put on my tie I come I preach the word and I expect God to do more bigger further greater that's insane that's all right I'm crazy I'm a Jesus freak Bible thumper I mean whatever you want to call me it don't matter and listen listen sowing and reaping so you if you keep sowing the, the same way that you've always sown, you're going to reap the same things you've always reaped for good or for bad. You follow me? For whether good or, or, or whether bad. And, and this is the true, this is true in every facet of our life. So this is a new year. Some of you have uh, established some, uh, some goals for this new year and maybe you've established some health goals and you decided this is a year I'm getting my diet in order and I'm gonna exercise. And I will tell you something, um, you, uh, for what you put into it is what you will get out of it, okay? And the, the problem is, and what I always struggle with is the putting into it, right? We all want the quick fix. I remember when I was a kid, there was one of these ads on TV. It was called, literally, it's called Dream Away. Dream Away. 
and it was a bandage that you like put around your body, like an ace bandage. You slept in it and you woke up and you looked like a Greek god, man. You're like, I dreamt it away. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and, but, but man, when you, when you decide, listen, I'm going to put good things in my body. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep. I'm going to actually let my body rest. And, and, and you decide that you're going to exercise and get your heart rate up. And, and you know, then guess what? It's going to yield results. Because what you put in is what you get out. Same is true in your relational goals. Maybe you're here today and your marriage is on the rocks, man. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Here, let, here's a little pointer for all you guys out there. We are one month away from Valentine's Day. Imagine what it will do for your marriage if you start planning today for Valentine's Day instead of February 13th. Come on. It'll ch- what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. It's true with your financial goals. You keep spending recklessly the way that you've always spent. You're going to keep yielding the same results that you've always yielded. You're going to keep getting the same debt because guess what? Unless, unless you got a massive raise and didn't touch it, then things haven't changed. So what's got to change is what you put into it. Church, it, and if it's true in your health and it's true in your relational issues and it's true in your finances, it's also true of your spiritual goals. So because, like I said, time is a great teacher, I want to share something with you and then we're going to close. I was sitting in my office. In my office, I have a couch and, and, and the couch faces my desk. And behind my desk, I have all of these themes, all of our church's themes. You can put them up there, yeah. They're, they're framed on my, on my wall behind my, behind my desk. And I was looking at them in order, in sequential order. And, and God revealed something, Holy Spirit revealed something to me that I never realized before. And, and he started revealing, because he'd given me this scripture about sowing and reaping. And he said, I want you to look, Chris. He said, in 2014, I, the church needed to begin sowing faith faith in a God of the impossible and because you did you reaped the overflow and then in 2016 was a year that you sowed deeper faith and because you sowed deeper then you reaped a new thing and in 2018 you sowed redeeming the time that you have and because you did you reaped fully alive living and so church, I will tell you that as we get into this, we get into this season of sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping, then this year, 2020, I couldn't have planned this. This is just what God does. It's a year of sowing. It's a year of investing. It's digging deeper. It's saying, listen, I'm going to put it right on my forehead and I'm going to say, Shema. I'm going to hear what the Lord wants me to do. Not acting haphazardly, not doing the things I've always done. I want to get my directors from the Lord. I'm going to open up this book and expect him to speak to me. And I'm going to act out of obedience whenever he does. I'm going to go where he wants me to go and do what he wants me to do and say what he wants me to say. There's a reason that when trials and temptations of this year present themselves that if you are not totally committed to him in every facet of your being then the waves will seem too big (laughs) they will the mountains will seem too high and the giants will seem too powerful your worry and your anxiety and your fears are going to cast a huge shadow on your life but Jesus has to be absolute preeminent number one solely here Oh, Israel, the Lord, our God is one. He's the first. He's in front. He is the one. Love him with everything that's in you. And when you do, it doesn't matter what the world throws at you because you're not operating any longer in the natural, but you have been empowered by the supernatural power, grace, love, strength, hope, future of God and he is going to order your steps he has seen us faithful in so some of the things here in this church but can I tell you everything that God's done to this point has just scratched the surface this is this is not a, 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 a this is I'm not trying I'm not this isn't a hype up moment what I'm trying to say is true we look at what God's done I said we had our board meeting this this week uh, this past Friday 
and we were looking at the year in finance and we were looking at the numbers and looking at all the things as we're preparing for the business meeting. And I will tell you, it leads you floored. You sit back and you're like, wow, God. But then when you realize what God truly wants to do through this body, it, you, you understand that it's, it, it's just scratching the surface. God wants so much more for you. He wants, he wants, it is so far, the Bible says, beyond what you can ever ask for or imagine. And I can imagine a lot. And I can ask for a lot. And it's far beyond it. Can I tell you that this building that we're going to build is not the be all end all. That's just the next step. God's got beyond for this church. He's got for beyond past my time here. He's got beyond past your time here. He's got blessings for your children and your children's children and for decades and for generations to come. We are sowing into the kingdom of God to see him do great things. But here's the thing, and I'm closing, continuing to close, right, Mike? <laughs> that, was, that was my intro. <clears throat> Anybody watch Shark Tank, that movie, that show Shark Tank on TV? Got some Shark Tank lovers. Jeanette watches it too every night for about two minutes and then she falls asleep. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Shark Tank, sometimes an entrepreneur will pitch an idea and, the, and, and one of the investors or the sharks will say, well, do you have another job? Do you have an occupation? And if they say yes, before the investor will invest, he'll say, I will invest on a contingency that you quit your job. Because I'm not going to make an investment into somebody who's, who's the best part of their day is being tied up somewhere else. I want your attention on, on this. And, and so essentially what they're saying is, is if something else is your safety net, if something else is your provision, then, then I'm always going to get what's left over. I'm not going to get the best part of you. And that's why the investor wants them to go all in. And the same is true with God. He doesn't want our leftovers. He's not looking for you to just spend yourself all week and to come in here on Sunday only and just try to recharge. He wants, he wants to be the absolute first in your life. So when you go to your job, you go to your job loving God. When you go to uh, go out with your family, go out with your family loving God. That's why, that, that's why Shema said, uh, teach your children, tell them again and again. When you're out and about, talk to them about the things of God. You see, he doesn't want our he doesn't want to be second best in our life. He doesn't want you to find safety and security in any of his creation. He wants you to find it in him as the creator. Church, I I, I meet so many crisis Christians, people who come to church because for, their marriage is in trouble, they just got the diagnosis. Um, you know, their, their finances are a mess. And they, and they bring that to, the, to the, 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 they don't grace the church until crisis hits. And then they come in and they pray and the church rallies around them. And God is so gracious. He does great works in their life. And then as soon as, as, soon as all the dust is settled, they're right back out the door again. And we all know people that, that are like that. And, 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 I, and I will tell you that God isn't looking to be second best in our life. He's not looking to be, he's not looking, to, he wants to be your first. I know this may sound harsh. I had a football coach, he used to say, he used to say second is first place loser. We, we, he's not looking to be second. He wants to be Lord of your life. Lord. That means he's in control. And so maybe you're here sitting sitting here this morning and, and you're here and you're in it to win it, man. You, you're all in. You're invested. You want to you see God do incredible things because your eternity is on the line and you get that. And you're running after Jesus with all. But, but maybe you're here today and, and you've been willing to trust God with your finances or you're willing to love him with your heart or, or maybe you're, you're hoping him with your spirit or, or you pray to him with your lips or you rely on him for your soul, but, but, he, but you haven't given him all your heart and all your soul. And can, can I just tell you something? What God wants and what God's asking for, for us this year is a, a season of sowing. And he wants to, us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind 
and all our strength and all our talents and all our finances and with all of our dreams and with all of my plans. He wants you to trust him with all of your fears and all of your enemies and all of your doubts and to give him all of your guilt and to trust him with all of your shame. He wants to transform all of your past. He wants to redeem all of your sin. He wants to reveal all of your purpose. He wants you to ask him to empower you with all of his spirit, to equip you with all of his resources, to protect you with all of his armies so that you will be victorious over all your enemies in all of your directives, in every situation, in all times, in all seasons, in every way you win because you you love the Lord your God with all. Stand with me. Let's worship Him. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you invested in us and you gave us everything in your Son, Jesus, that you made the eternal investment so that we would have a way where there was no way. And I pray, God, that as we move into this year, this season of with all, I ask, God, that you would help us to keep that in the forefront of our minds and in the center of our heart and in the midst of our strength and in all of our soul that we love you with all. And I pray, God, that as you challenge us throughout this year, God, that our hearts would be to admit and to repent and to submit and to move forward as we go deeper and more committed to you. We love you, Father. We thank you because you are a good, good Father. And we love what you're going to do. You've been so faithful in the past. You're faithful today. And we know that you're faithful tomorrow. Your blessings are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness. We love you with all, Lord. Now bless these, your people, as we go our separate ways. Help us to fight off every temptation, trial, tribulation with absolute victory. In the name of Yeshua, our King and our Lord, we thank you. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great week. Well, hello, 1130. God bless you.